This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. The following chapter goes through and looks at employee benefits, uh, which is covered by IAS 19. Essentially, employee benefits in this exam is all about pensions and how we account for them. I'm not going to give you any pension advice uh, about what you should be doing with regards to saving. Uh, it's all about how to account for a pension scheme within a company set of financial statements. Uh, so if we look at the scope of IS19 and what it covers, uh, it goes through there and covers four aspects. Uh, it looks at what's referred to as short term benefits. So looking there essentially at your wages, uh, your salaries, uh, and could it potentially be there at any holiday pay? Uh, it then goes through and looks at any other long term benefits that you have. Uh, so that could be maybe along the lines of looking upon how you get looked after, if you like, uh, upon retirement. OK, uh, and then you have there any termination benefits. It always sounds like a bit of an oxymoron, that doesn't it? Termination benefits. Uh, is there a benefit of being terminated? I suppose there is, isn't there? Uh, and then you will get a substantial payoff. Uh, at least hopefully you would. Uh, if you've been made redundant okay uh, and then we go through and look at post-employment benefits which for you and i are, are essentially going through there and looking at your pensions okay uh short-term benefits wages salaries holiday pay based on accruals we're not going to go through and look at that okay keep it anything other than pensions is all based upon the accruals concept uh any other long-term benefits so maybe disability benefits or benefits that you get uh, upon retirement whereby you may be looked after with regards to healthcare benefits uh, again i'm not too worried about that we will see how they are accounted for particularly with regards to post-employment benefits because they're very similar so i'm not worried about that and termination benefits essentially uh, we're not too fussed about that either all of those are, are, are based upon the accruals concept so matching the expense the period to which it relates if it crops up in any past exam questions that's where we'll go through and see it because the focus here is on post-employment benefits. And like I said, that is pensions, okay? Uh, so when we're looking at pensions, uh, there are two types of pensions. The first one is referred to as your defined contribution pension scheme, which if you're in the UK, you may hear it discussed as your money purchase scheme. And then the other one is referred to as your defined benefit scheme. Again, in the UK, uh, it's also referred to as your final salary scheme. Uh, defined contribution, defined benefit, very different in terms of schemes. The accounting treatment, again, it is very, very different between the two. Uh, one is much easier than the other. The defined contribution is so much more straightforward than the defined benefit scheme. So therefore, if you're thinking about examinability, which one's going to crop up? Yeah, you've got it. Yeah, your defined benefit scheme, your final salary scheme. I say it's complex. It's much more straightforward than what it used to be. Okay, uh, A lot of the complexities have been withdrawn from it to try and make it a little bit easier to account for and make it more understandable for the users as well, okay? So let's go through there and look at the defined contribution pension scheme first. So also referred to as your money purchase. Uh, but I think if you think about it as a defined contribution, it's very, very literal, isn't it, okay? Uh, what goes into the pension scheme is a defined contribution, a fixed amount. So what goes through and happens here is that the company pays a fixed contribution so a contribution that is defined, and they will pay that in monthly. And the key aspect here is that that goes into your pension fund, your employee's pension fund. So you could find a pension provider in your country and your company will pay an amount into that pension fund. OK, uh, the key bit, uh, whatever the company pays into your pension fund is that you will then get a variable return. OK, there's no risk attached to the company. They pay amount into your pension fund. You run the risk of that pension fund going up, of going down. Hopefully it will go up and up and up. And the higher it gets to, the more you get of a return. If it falls in value, you get much less of a return. So the risk is very much with the employee. That There's no risk at all associated with the company. If you get to retirement and your pension fund has fallen in value, you can't go back to the company and request for some more pension. Okay, They have transferred their risk over to you. So it, it's great in that you're getting money for your retirement, but as an employee, you do have a little bit of risk Okay, because you have a variable 
return. That, however, makes the accounting for the contribution very easy. Yeah, all the company is going to do. So remember, even though the company is paying into your scheme, we're looking at what the company accounts for. Well, the company is going to recognize an expense. So, so debit the expense. Uh, and what they do is they credit their cash or credit their accruals. Nice and simple month end adjustment. Uh, the amount that they expense is with the agreed contribution. So the company will agree to pay a percentage of your monthly salary into your pension scheme. So it could be 5%. If you're lucky, it could be more. That's just too straightforward. Very unlikely to see that uh, within an exam question. If it was to be in an exam question, it would be a discussion between the defined contribution and the defined benefit scheme. Okay, numerically, eh, eh, not going to see it. Okay, too straightforward, unfortunately, but there we go. Uh, what you are likely to see particularly from a numerical perspective, is the defined benefit scheme or, if you like, a, a final salary scheme. And the difference here is that the benefit that you get upon retirement is defined. So instead of having a variable return, you get a fixed return at the end. And the risk, if you like, lies with the company because they are guaranteeing you that fixed return. So in order to generate that fixed return, what's going to happen is that the company is going to pay a variable contribution okay if, if the, the the scheme is doing well they don't need to pay in so much money if the scheme isn't doing so well they need to top up that pension scheme because the key bit is that the risk lies with the company because the company is paying into its own pension fund and then hopefully when you come to retire there will be sufficient amounts of cash within the company pension fund to pay you on retirement if there isn't the company is going to be in a little bit of financial difficulty, isn't it? Because the risk lies with them and they have to find the benefit that you get on retirements. OK, so the, the difference that you have here is the company is going to have to account not just for the variable contributions, but it's going to have to actually account for that pension fund as well. Because within that pension fund, as we make investments, we build up the asset. And as we build up the asset, we're also hopefully building up a corresponding liability. Okay, and then when you come to retire, what happens? It's brilliant. It's the golden pension scheme, isn't it? You get a guaranteed return on your retirement. And the reason why it's called a final salary, because that is normally based upon a percentage of your final salary. So the longer that you work at the company, the higher the percentage and the longer you work at the company as well, the higher your salary. So, you know, that the companies could be susceptible to, to huge payouts in the future and significant amounts of risk if the company pension fund isn't doing so well okay uh so when we start to look at the accounting which we'll see in the next video you know that becomes very very complex because as well as accounting for the actual contribution you need to account for the, the change in the value of the assets the change in the value of the liabilities uh, where do the changes in the values of the assets and the value of the liabilities appear do they go to profit or loss do they go to other comprehensive income uh it, it becomes very complex indeed uh, because there is a lot of variability in it. Uh, and we don't want variability to, to come from a pension scheme hitting our profits, do we? So maybe the variability might be hidden away in other comprehensive income. But I'll touch upon that a, a little bit later on. Okay, key bit is to summarise the differences, isn't it? Okay, to make sure that we know the differences before we go through and think about the complex accounting for your defined benefit scheme. Okay, so the key bit with your defined contribution is that the risk, is with the employee, isn't it? Okay, yeah, the money is paid into your pension scheme. If your pension scheme doesn't perform well, tough, okay? Can't do anything about it. You just have to work a little bit longer. Uh, however, what that then means from a company perspective, that's great because they just pay a fixed amount, isn't it? Every single year. Again, admittedly, they put it in monthly, but it's a fixed amount as, as a percentage of your monthly or your annual salary. So it's much easier from budgeting perspectives as well, isn't it, uh, for a company to, to operate a defined contribution scheme. And that, that's much more common in business today. OK, the defined benefit is an older style scheme uh, commonly run by old government run businesses. OK, so, so British Airways in the UK, uh, the post office in the UK still operate final salary schemes. But that was because they, they were government run businesses. They've now been privatised. And those private entities don't like risk, do they? Okay. 
And that's the key bit. You know, if you have a defined benefit scheme, the risk is with the employer, isn't it? OK, uh, so the risk is with the company uh, and there is therefore a variability in terms of those contributions. However, from an employee perspective, it's great, isn't it? Uh, because you get a guaranteed return on retirement. OK, uh, but as I said, a lot of companies don't like that risk, don't like paying the variable amounts into the company pension fund. Uh, that doesn't help with budgeting, does it? Uh, there's a lot of risk, particularly the, the markets are fluctuating regularly with economic circumstances, particularly following the UK decision to, to leave the EU. Uh, so, you know, companies are moving from your defined benefit over more towards your defined contribution scheme, which is good from a company perspective. But from yours and my perspective, uh, it, it, it's not as rewarding, is it? So maybe we can be rewarded or, or incentivized in other manners. And that's where we start to look at share based payments in a later chapter. But what I want you to take on board here is the differences between the defined benefit and the defined contribution scheme. Don't worry so much about the accounting just for now. And once you've understood the differences, uh, that will help you understand where the risk lies uh, and how that impacts, if you like, things from a company perspective and from an employee perspective. Because a past exam question, and you will see it as we work through some past exam questions later on, is that a past exam question has asked you, based upon a particular circumstance, whether or not this scheme is a defined contribution or a defined benefit scheme. Okay, and if you follow what we've spoken about there, you shouldn't find yourself having too many difficulties being able to understand which is which. Right, let's go through and pull it together with a numerical example to help you understand what's happening with your defined benefit scheme. The example here is more likely to be used by the examiner that feeds into question number one within group accounts. So it's likely to be that the parent has a defined benefit scheme and you need to account for that defined benefit scheme with the numbers uh, in the parent's books. So we'll work it through and as we go along, we'll show how it fits into a group's question. It's unlikely now that you would see something like this uh, within question number two or question number three. Okay. So it says the amounts to appear in the financial statement. So the financial statement, statement of financial position, statement of profit or loss. Uh, Finland. So Finland could be the parent, say, in question number one. For the year ended, is it there, December 2015? Okay, so that's my closing year, isn't it? Uh, it says here we operate a defined benefit pension scheme. So as soon as we see that, we're thinking, right, what goes on my statement of financial position? Uh, what goes on my statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income? Well, on the SFP, we're looking at my pension asset, aren't we? Net off against my pension liability. And then when we're thinking about your statement of profit or loss on OCI, uh, we're thinking there, aren't we, about my my service costs, the interest, maybe your return on assets, and then there uh, within your other comprehensive income, we're looking at your measurement component, okay? Right, again, the measurement component would need a working, so I would then split my page into two halves to look at the working for my asset and then the working for my liability. Okay. And again, what we usually start off with is the brought forward that is then reconciled, isn't it, to the carry forward. So uh, what have we got? Uh, it says there the closing balances on the scheme assets and liabilities at December 2014 was 60 and 64 respectively. So on my assets, I have 60. On my liabilities, I have 64. Uh, it then tells us about everything, doesn't it, to do with what happens in December 2015. So I've got my service costs. Is that nine and eight? So both of those are going to go to the statement of profit or loss, aren't they? So there I can find my statement of profit or loss, can't I? 
9 plus 8 is that there as 17. Okay. Uh, we've got the contributions paid in, the benefits paid out. So I will deal with those, won't I, in my adjustments for my assets and liabilities. And then I've got the fair value of the plan assets and the fair value of the plan liabilities. They're going to appear on the SFP, aren't they? So is that there 66? And 75? Is that there a net pension asset? Is that of nine? Yeah, nine. Okay. Excellent. Uh, we're then told, is it there that the yield on high quality corporate bonds is 5%? So assuming that all the transactions take place at the end of the year, uh, you have there that 5% to allocate to the assets and liabilities. So the interest is 5%, is it of 64? The return on the asset is 5% of 60. So my interest expense is 3.2. I presume then 5% of 60 is 3, isn't it? Okay. Not too difficult. Again, if we're thinking about it from a group's perspective up there, just a little bit different, isn't it? Uh, you would show the net pension liability of nine. So you would record that within your non-current liabilities. Uh, the profit or loss figures, the service cost, the interest and the return. Well, if Finland is the parent, they need to go through the parent's profits or loss. So the parent's retained earnings and the parent's retained earnings are in working five. So those three figures that you see up there would be adjustments to working number five. Clearly, if you're asked to prepare the group statement of profit or loss, they will be adjustments in the parent's column. And those adjustments in the parents column would go respectively within the correct line items. So service costs within the operating expenses, interest and return within the financing section. Uh, the issue that you've got now is looking at the remeasurement components. So what you've got there on the asset, you have the return, which was three. And on the liability, the interest was 3.2. Okay. Uh, the other bits and pieces that you've got with regards to the liability were the service costs, weren't they? I think they were there, was it at 17? Okay. Uh, bits that were missing, uh, the contributions that have been paid in are five. So you've credited the bank, debited your assets. Is that there as five? Uh, the benefits that have been paid out are six. So remember, that's the one that you really need to go through and give some thought to because you liquidate the asset and you liquidate the liability. Okay, so you remove the liability and you remove the assets. The only one that you need to deal with in both the asset and the liability. Okay, uh, I can then total those up, can't I? So on the assets I have, is it 62? I have, is it 78.2? That's what we expect it to be. However, when we look at the carry forward, the actual as provided by the actuary, we have 66 and 75. There we go. Once we've done that, we can then begin to put in your balancing figures. So put the balancing figures in first and then think about whether it's a gain or a loss. So 4 and negative 3.2. Right, let's think. The assets have gone up from 62 to 66. Uh, that's what the actuary has processed at the end of the year they should have been 62 they are now 64 so there's an increase in the assets an increase in asset is a good thing so that is therefore a gain isn't it okay uh, if you look at the liability the liability we expect was 78.2 it's now 75 so that reduction in liability of 3.2 again is a good thing isn't it a reduction in a liability 
is a good thing. So again, we have a gain. So what we have there is we have two gains, one of four, one of 3.2. So we have a remeasurement gain in total. Is it there? Out of 7.2. Okay. Excellent. There you have it. Okay. Brilliant. Uh, any questions? No, all reasonably happy. Okay. Uh, what we could go through and do uh, is we could, and we'll be clever here, clever or foolish, it's one or the other. You don't have to normally do this, but you can go through there and perform a reconciliation of the opening to the closing pension asset or liability. What do we mean? Well, at the start of the year, we had, was it an asset of 60 and a liability of 64? So the start of the year, there would have been, is it a brought forward liability of four? At the end of the year, we have a carry forward liability. I think that was there as nine. So you don't have to do this. This is just a demonstration. It will lead us into what happens with regards to the cash flow as well. So what you've got there is we have a look. Is it at the figures that go there into the statement of profit or loss? So what you've got on your statement of profit or loss, if you were to, to net those up, 17 plus 3.2 less 3 uh, gives me there is that 17.2. as an expense okay so if i go through there and put the statement of profit or loss that's there is it as 17.2 uh, if we then go through and think about what happens with regards to other comprehensive income uh, what goes through other comprehensive income was that there as a gain wasn't it and we netted that off of 7.2 so that there is 7.2. And then what you've got is thinking about the, the statement of financial position. So what actually happens with regards to the cash? And the cash is looking at what has been paid into the scheme, hasn't it? Uh, what was paid into the scheme was, was 5. So that goes through there and reduces the liability doesn't it because it's increasing the asset and if you go through there and total that up i've given myself just a little bit too much space is you've got the the reconciliation of the opening to the closing figure okay uh, again why is that important well what you've got there is that the cash that you've paid in that figure there is going to go into the statement of cash flows just be careful when it goes into the statement of cash flows it is an outflow because the company has paid it out but paid it into the scheme okay so that is an outflow uh, you could throw that there into your investing activities okay uh, uh, or alternatively then what you've got is the figures is it on your statement of profit or loss Again, they will need to go through and be adjusted to start thinking there. Are there any non-cash expenses? Well, I believe there are, aren't there? If you go back and have a look at the service costs, uh, those service costs are some non-cash expenses. So therefore, you would need to go through and add back those service costs to the profit because they reduce your profit without going through there and reducing your cash. So you would need to add back the service costs, the interest and the return. You would need to adjust through either your finance costs or your interest income. Uh, so you would need to go through there and see if that has an impact essentially on the cash figure. OK, because again, neither that interest nor that return has been paid. Uh, so you would need to go through there and adjust it. Uh, through your expense and any opening and closing interest receivables or interest payables. But I think maybe I've just gone a little bit too far, uh, but doesn't do us any harm. I think the key bits to take on board 
from this example is from the statement of financial position, then that nine up the top goes within the group SFP, doesn't it, in terms of the parents. Uh, the adjustments through profit or loss go into the parents' retained earnings. Uh, the other comprehensive income would go into the other component of equity of the parent. And then, by all means, if you wish, don't perform the reconciliation. But by looking at the reconciliation, we can begin to see that maybe there are some non-cash items and there are also some cash flows to adjust for within the statement of cash flows. But we shall leave it there. Uh, work through that example again and when you work it through forget about anything to go through and do with cash flow uh, just go through there and have a play around with the numbers that are there within the financial statements on the position statement and the performance statements make sure you can work out the expenses in profit or loss and then the most important bit is to work out the remeasurement component isn't it with the then there through your other comprehensive income other than that, I think there's loads of little examples that are there within your chosen tuition providers and revision kits, uh, and more importantly, that the study manual. Have a practice at some of those. Other than that, I'll see you all in the next little session when we begin to look at some tiny little add-ons on top of the basics of pensions.